Hello, I'm Ella Sillywood and welcome to tonight's Insight, supported by Rolex. Today, we're exploring Richard Jones's brand new production of La Clemenza de Tito. Mozart's final opera tells the story of a society threatened by change. It's full of political scheming and murderous plots that push the ruler's mercy to its very limits. It returns to the Royal Opera House stage for the first time since 2002, and you have a chance to be in the audience because it will be streamed live around the world on the 21st of May. So make sure you visit the Royal Opera House website if you want to get your hands on a ticket. Tonight, we're going to start things off with three members of the fabulous cast, Edgaris Montvidas, Nicole Chevalier, and Emily D'Angelo. Very excited to have you all with me today. I can't wait to get started. I've got a huge list of questions. Oh boy. <laughs> Great to be here. So, Nicole, I'm going to start off with you. So, let's talk a little bit about the character you're playing. Tell mm. me more about her. Um, I'm playing the character of Vitalia, and <clears throat> she, she's a yeah, very colourful, I would say, uh, person. She was raised to um, take the throne. She's, and she's frustrated that it's not happening the way she thought. Um, it's the, the piece starts, you know, right in the middle of it all, and um, we're already in the middle of the story. Um, Tito is, is ruling, and his father is the one who killed my father. Um, we are not on the same path as far as our political opinions. And um, she's a very volatile, I would say, uh, person, personality. She has probably no filter, we would say today. Um, she has an incredible amount of thoughts and emotions, and they all seem to um, have no stage. Yeah? There's no moment where she can really say something until she either creates this moment, you know, together with uh, Sesto, and tries to take power, yeah, in this relationship through vengeance and manipulation and, um, yes, I, I think also attraction too, of course. A good opera. <laughs> and, um, yeah, um, it's a power struggle for her. And she has a wonderful turn in the end, but it's, it's you know... Her demise or her exit is already pretty much guaranteed, so she doesn't really, she doesn't receive so much clemency, let's say. <laughs> I have to say, I was thinking as you said that, yeah. very classic, uh, classic opera motivations there for yeah. your character, <laughs> really wonderful. <laughs> Emily, tell me a little bit about your character. So I'm playing the character of Sesto, um, sort of perfectly situated here between <laughs> my two uh, <laughs> My friend and my lover, my, my, the, the sort of focus of all of my attention at this moment is Vitalia. Mm -hmm. And um, my good friend is Tito. And given Vitalia's very complicated political situation and personal situation as well, her desire for power, it seems regardless of, of uh, you know, for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I've been sort of coerced in a way uh, to kill my good friend Tito over there. Um, so in a nutshell, you know, torn and, uh, and struggling between, between two people I care very much about um, and, uh, and sort of the fallout of, of that struggle. Mm -hmm. Egaris, same question to you. Tell us a little bit about your character. Oh, well, so <laughs> I'm playing the guy, you know, so I'm playing... Um, well, the the Emperor, <laughs> Tito Vespasiano. And um, if you look at the score, you sort of think, okay, Emperor, good guy, full of clemency and all that. But I'm always asking a lot of uncomfortable questions to myself, you know. Um, is his character or, you know, is his kind of, is him being so good is the tool to manipulate other people 
um, why is he so keen um, to have Sesto sort of as a very good friend? Why is he not really unhappy when you know all these marriages not happening? Sort of. So there are a lot of a lot of sort of things, and I I always when I create a new role, I am trying to look beyond two dimension, you know, just to sort of just to find like really um, edgy kind of corners to give the character a lot of colors because you know for my voice type th there are so many characters that I you know play that are lovers poets mm -hmm. and it can be sort of boring in a way if you do not find some sort of really odd sometimes um, characteristics so uh, so so here as well in in this production um, it's it's so interesting to find all these ways all these kind of like really uncomfortable questions and um, but other than that yes I, I, I you know I, I forgive <laughs> a lot in this <laughs> opera um, and and everybody is happy about that I mean it feels like there's a lot to delve into here <laughs> for each of you so yes. how have you found working with Richard Jones to to bring these characters to life well I am a big fan of Richard Jones because you know when I when I joined Young Artists Program here 2001, I was able to you know come and see all the productions um, here in in this opera house. So I completely fell in love you know when I saw you know all his productions here. So it was my you know a dream to to work with him. So so here we are um, back to Royal Opera House working with Richard Jones, you know, what can be better. Um, the rehearsals are very intense. Um, I sort of feel like we're doing kind of like a theater piece rather than an opera, you know, because we, we talk a lot. We, we're trying to find these answers. We, um, we kind of, yeah, there's a lot of psychology and, you know, philosophy sort of involved. It's really good. It's very detailed and it will look great and, and, and there's no sort of like a big, um, how should I put it, uh, effects. It's all based on us, you know, on actors, singers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's all about the relationship with, between us because it's, it's very, you know, minimalistic sort of, if I, if I may, may say, mm -hmm. the production. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I love that we can actually, my big passion is acting. And when you can sort of combine acting and singing, then it's just fantastic. Obviously, Nicole, Emily, you've placed these roles before. So how mm -hmm. does it feel to, to revisit them? Um, yeah, it's actually one of my favorite Mozart operas. I was asked early on to sing it, and I, I was like, ah, oh, oh well. Uh, not, for the, <laughs> not for the acting standpoint, but I just thought musically, well, who did he write this for, you know? Um, and it's also someone that has really lived life, yeah? I, I, don't, I don't think it's a very easy role to play if you haven't been through some ups and downs, yeah? <laughs> Gone down a few bumpy roads. And, um, yeah, I, I completely agree. It's... Um, it's an opera. Um, you now you have to think about Mozart. Uh, you have to think about like the time in which he, which he wrote his operas. They were like pop music. They were for the people, and it was really revolutionary. And it was his way to express what was internally going on in the society, but also his his beliefs. Yeah, and so um, it's very uh, it's very emotional. Yeah except it's extremely exact uh, as far as how you technically articulate the music. Yeah, but you have to crash the two worlds together. And that is a super challenge and also really exciting because it is, you have to be a singing actor. Yeah? And I agree, the, the set is really reduced. Um, so the focus is on us, you know? We have to be really great storytellers, yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, 
Emily, you played Anio previously, and this time you're Zesto. So are you approaching it differently? Are there different vocal challenges, perhaps, this time around? Yeah, I mean, these are two very different characters. So I've played Anio a few times, and this is my first, uh, okay. my first yeah. Zesto. And uh, La Clemenza di Tito was really the first opera that I learned front to back as a student. So I have a close relationship or, or sort of admiration for this for this opera and to play to play Sesto is really very exciting and uh, these two roles are I mean they're night and day in a way and it's fascinating that they are played by the same voice type um, mezzo soprano plays both of these roles but they're so different the tessitura where the where the um, where the voice sits is is very different the length of course is very different just speaking strictly mm -hmm. technically um, but the characters themselves are they're experiencing sort of they're in the same world and experiencing the same situation but but Anio is sort of so pure and so his morals are so focused he he walks a straight a straight road right and and Sesto has this huge conflict that he's come across he's put his, himself into this situation and and he struggles and he struggles and he struggles so the turmoil of of this character um, not that either one is more or less complex, not a, that, a, that a, a morally strict person is less, is less complicated than someone who has conflict, but uh, it's, it's a very different experience, and I'm, I'm very lucky to, to get to explore both these characters. Mm. I have to say, yeah. I can't wait to watch, but we are going to have a little excerpt right now from you, Edgar, aren't we? So tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, so this is the, uh, yeah, this is the uh, very looks first very aria. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the very first aria from Act One, where, you know, he's kind of talking about the advantages and disadvantages being a ruler, basically. Lovely. Well, I can't wait to hear it. Huge thank you yeah, to thank Nicole you. and Emily and Agaris. I'll let you get yourself set up, of course, where you'll be accompanied by Susanna Stranders on piano. Thank you. Ma che se mi negate che benefica io sia che mi lasciate del più sublime soglio l'unico frutto
Well, that was utterly joyful. How beautiful, how captivating. I have to say, one of my favourite bits of the job. Thank you so much, Edgaris, and of course, Susanna Stranders on piano. Now, I am delighted to be joined by the conductor, Mark Wigglesworth. Hello, lovely to have Hello. you with me. Nice to see you. So, I'm going to start off with a big question, because of course, this is one of Mozart's let's say, less-known operas. It's, it's not as famous as, say, Don Giovanni or, or Marriage of Figaro. So is that because there are compositional differences between them? It, it, did he have a different approach to this opera? It's interesting, isn't it? I've asked myself that question a lot. Why is this piece, which everybody who is part of it adores so much, mm -hmm. less famous, frankly, mm -hmm. than the Figaro's and Cousy's and Don Giovanni's? When you watch those operas, you're so conscious of Mozart's genius in every single melody, every single dramatic situation. He kind of, he's on stage there too, in a way that is extraordinary. And, and yet, in this piece, he seems to go one level further in that he is invisible. And I think the genius of this piece is that he is not present somehow. And so you're not aware of his extraordinary ability, and yet, that is something even more admirable. And what he gives the performers is some kind of, it's a sort of blank uh, template for them to invest their own ideas in order to communicate to the audience. The, the Da Ponte operas are so powerful, and we all know them so well, that performers, directors, and conductors come to it with a set of kind of expectations and traditions and self-consciousness in the choice. That, oh, I'm not going to do that. Everybody expects me to do that. I'm not going to do that. And so there's a kind of Mozart's in the room, in a way. In this piece, it's because it's not so often performed, I feel everybody's freer to make a much more sincere uh, set of choices. What do we really want this character to be? What do we want the story to tell? How do we want to tell it? And the freedom he gives us is something that is unbelievably profound. There are not so many tunes that you'd, as beautiful as it is, you don't go along, you don't go home singing the tunes. And yet the music's working at a, in a way, a more profound level than that. That's a really interesting perspective. Do you, do you think that is why it's performed less? Is it that perhaps the freedom is almost a little bit intimidating? Well, I certainly think if you are going to perform it, it needs to be performed properly, <laughs> by which I mean a new production with a, a proper rehearsal period in which everybody in the room can take the time to find out what we feel as a group about it. it, it I think the opera on, in a, as a revival situation with people flying in and just singing their roles in the way they might feel comfortable doing it, then I think the piece probably struggles. But in the conditions and the circumstances that we have, um, I think that's, that's the best way to do this piece. It's the best way to do every piece, of course, but some pieces need that more than others. So what's it been like to be in the rehearsal room with Richard Jones? How have you been developing these characters through the music? Well, the wonderful thing about Richard is, is, is he's well known, he's a, he's a musician and he's listening. And uh, we're all at home before the uh, project starts with generating our own opinions, the director, the conductor, the singers. We all kind of have a view but um, if you come to the room and your only agenda is, is maintaining that view, there's obviously going to be conflict. And apart from anything else, it's going to be a limited result. I come to the room with a sort of set of options, in a way. Um, and you listen to what the director wants and what the singers offer. And you kind of merge your decisions onto that. And I think the singers do the same, and I think Richard does the same. We all come with a plan, but it's a plan that is open to something more special that is created at that moment. And I think the ideal uh, performance is one where the choices are not the ones that any of us had imagined in advance, but that become apparent as a result of all of our working together. I think audiences can tell that that is unique and not a kind of r repetition of something that's happened before. And I think even if they can't articulate that that's what's happening, the spontaneity of the performance 
is generated by uh, everybody being very confident in their view, but not to the extent that eliminates the possibility of a, of a better one. I mean, that sounds very uh, utopian, very idyllic. Well, it, I mean, working with Richard is pretty utopian, oh, and, really? uh, to be honest. And if you have singers uh, that have the s come with the same set of priorities, and uh, it is as good as it gets, yeah. Have there been any, any challenges, whether for you or the artists on stage? Um, in, in a bad way. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I just don't think you'd term a challenge. <laughs> well, I don't think it's a challenge. I mean, I think it's, it, the job is listening to the room, listening to what it actually sounds like. Um, I, have a, I can't choose a speed until I hear that singer sing it. I, I, I have a view as how far something should go, but until I hear that particular voice do it, uh, I don't know if it's valid or not. Similarly, without knowing Richard's take on not just the broadest picture, but the very detail of every line, you don't know if your musical view is, is going to work. So the challenge is making sure that everybody, I think, stays open and stays listening and um, listening as an, as, an, as an active part of, of creativity rather than just a, something you then respond to. Of course, you're working with a socially distanced orchestra this time around, so has that changed your approach? Um, I prefer to use the word physical distance because whoever came up with social distance, I mean, we're not, as a species, we don't socially distance. That's, that's, that's an oxymoron, you know. Physically distance, you can still be social, and an orchestra proves that. Yes, they are sit seated further apart than normal, and, that, and what the problems of that are that they are, the musicians are not so able to make choices based on, on listening, which is how they should make choices. We should respond to what we hear. If people are further apart, then what you hear is, is potentially compromised by the physicality of the situation. So that is a, an un, an, a, a definite um, con. But what's interesting in terms of the pros is that every player is, f is reminded of their individual responsibility. The string players have their own music stands, and it's amazing how many of them love that. <laughs> and that, that although they miss the sort of group uh, surges and, and the thrill that comes from being in the group, um, the ones I've worked with so far are loving the opportunity to uh, engage even more as an individual with what they think it should, it should be. So it, it's not... It, 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 it's a little difficult in a practical sense, but their advantages are significant. Of course, you conducted the Royal Opera House Christmas concert and there was no audience there. So how do you feel that we're going to have audiences back in the stalls? Oh, it's fantastic. I mean, it's why we, it's why we all do it. Not, not because we want to perform to an audience, but because the audience are half of the experience. Without the audience, the experience doesn't exist. And... Um, this pandemic has proved, I think, beyond doubt, that, that music and opera is uh, something that needs to be shared. And that although online streaming is, has been, um, the companies have been able to do it, it's fantastic, they've been able to sort of hold, keep the flame going, it's not the real thing. The real thing is being in the room together, sharing it, and to have an audience um, we listen to audiences just as much as audiences listen to us. And there's such a presence and such a part of the choices we make as to how to do the next line. Audiences may think they're silent, and, and one hopes they are silent, but that silence is very audible and very um, full of intention that the performers f feed off. And then, of course, the audience feed off that. And so the two-way communication is, is what the whole thing is about. So, to have everyone who's back is, uh, I'm very excited about it. Well, I have to say, I'm going to take my role as an audience member a lot more seriously the next time I'm there, but thank you so much for chatting with me, Mark. Thank you. Now, I don't know about you, but I am ready to hear a little bit more from this wonderful opera. So please welcome Masabani Cecilia Rangwalasha to perform the Talia's act to Aria Non Piu di Fiori, accompanied again by Susanna Stranders on piano.
Well, well, I think all I can say to that is simply spectacular. I cannot wait to tune in. Now, let's delve a little deeper into this brand new production. So please welcome Movement Director Sarah Fay and Assistant Directors Dan Duna and Matilda DTL McNichol. So lovely to have you all here. Thank you. Dan, I'm going to start off with you. So mm. tell me when and where this production is set. Well, that's a very good question because um, the story is set in classical Rome. Uh, Titus was emperor between 79 and 81 AD, three years. But setting something in classical Rome on stage, togas, tricky, you know, most classical porticos and colonnades are not a design option that most designers would opt for willingly. Um, the piece was written uh, in 1791, uh, so in the shadow of the French Revolution, and it was written for the coronation uh, of the Emperor Leopold II as King of Bohemia, and so it was written as a very flattering picture of an Enlightenment ruler. The French mob would have said an, an Enlightenment despot, and, but with the 1791 factor, if you do set it in 1791, come some of the problems of putting on the piece, because it's not an easy piece to put on. It's, uh, it was written in an operatic form that was more abundant even then, the, the opera seria. It was written with two roles in a voice type, uh, a castrato, which virtually didn't exist anymore. Um, 
So uh, taking a historicist approach is uh, problematic. Um, Richard Jones has shown a lot of chutzpah by um, setting it in a past of recent memory and uh, taking Tito not as a paragon of governing virtues, but as a, a man with good and bad in him. And one of the problems of the piece, too, is that its happy ending is announced in its title, you know, no suspense. Richard gets around that by actually looking at the clemency of Titus as something that doesn't have its unproblematic sides. So it makes that interesting, too. Uh, I would, if you wanted to know more about what makes up our world, I refer you to Sarah, who um, created the world with Richard. Well, I, I started working on it after Richard and the designer Alts had already created what it looked like. And they've, they've made, I always think of it as a kind of parallel universe. It's, it's a Rome that has a nod to classicism, but which feels much more contemporary than that. And it's, um, it's a, a place where there's an exploration, I, I guess, of an idea of liberalism, um, but a kind of liber liberalism in politics, which is also joined with an idea of narcissism. So um, there's the piece as a whole is kind of viewed through the eyes of a Senate. And there is one character who's a senator who's um, called Publio. Um, and he's joined by another couple of non-singing actors, but they're actually also singers, <laughs> but they're being actors in our production. And um, we see the whole story really through the eyes of the Senate. And the story in our production is really the idea of a fall from grace, Tito's fall from incremental fall from grace, or fall from approval um, through the ideas of the Senate, um, because he has too much personal inclination. And he loves a kind of idea of inspiring people and an idea of beauty and, and being artistic, which actually papers over the cracks of what you really need to be a, a good ruler, which is to help create um, a society or a community where things are taken care of, you know, like food and sewerage and, and um, <laughs> all, of, all of those kinds of things. Um, and in our, so our, our production is set in a post-war Rome, early 20th century, but in a parallel universe. In our universe, there's not a Catholic God in our Rome. It's, you still have the kind of classical multiple gods and um, there's, there's kind of nodding to different ideas, some which feel even more recent than early 20th century. But it's, it's a world that hopefully allows us, that, that Richard and Nortz have created together, to really get into the character and behavior of the, um, you know, the, the characters, that we, we care about them, we care about what's happening, and we feel it on a visceral level, hopefully. Um, and the sets are, are amazing, they've, they've been, very much, um, they've had to be quite reduced from the original idea, post, <laughs> post the whole COVID thing. But actually, they've become much more essential. And you know, the performers and the characters are really exposed in the most kind of forensic and exciting of ways. You you really kind of look then at behaviour, and you know, it, it, this opera has everything. It has kind of, you know, attempted assassination, you know, <laughs> crazy love affairs. And um, yeah, it's, 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 it works and it's exciting. Mm, it's interesting mm. to hear what has and hasn't changed. Matilda, for you, of course, this is one of the first productions back at the Royal Opera House mm. since the pandemic. So what's different? Well, I think it's a really exciting first opera to be putting back on the Royal Opera House stage. Um, we have had to have some measures put in place to make sure that everyone is safe first of all, um, without sort of um, losing any of the intimacy of the storytelling, which is at the heart of the storytelling of this, of this opera. And so that's been, um, that's been fun and, and interesting in a way to kind of have these kind of COVID solutions. We're having to look at proximity on stage and without, yeah, as I say, losing that kind of connection and, and closeness, um, Richard and Sarah are having to solve that in other ways. And, 
Uh, we're allowed, you know, the occasional what we call hit and runs or bungee touches, uh, where we feel that's necessary for the storytelling. Um, but it's completely changed, I guess, how we're thinking and how, how like, the systems in the rehearsal room. Mm. We're normally very close geographically as a production desk. We're normally being fed notes in one ear and in the other, and we're... Robbing each other's rubbers yeah. and pencils. <laughs> and <laughs> we're not allowed to share stationery <laughs> at all. Um, and we're far away from each other, which took a bit of getting used to. And I think also, I don't want to speak for the singers, but um, acting and performing and you're wanting to naturally get closer um, when, you're, when you're working on a scene. And um, it's having to kind of put that red, red alert or that flag up for, like, for them and... Um, they're having to kind of get used to not, not, not getting close, which is strange in such an intimate art form. I mean, this feels like the perfect time, Sarah, mm. to bring in your role as movement director, <laughs> which feels incredibly relevant. So tell us a little bit about yeah. that role and, and, and what your, your work is like in the rehearsal room. So my role really is to help facilitate the embodiment of behaviour. So I need to understand what the thoughts are of each character and the psychology and understand what Richard's ideas are in relation to all of those things. And then I help facilitate uh, a singer taking on <laughs> physically so that, so that you read it. And sometimes more than others, depending on the situation and how many people are on stage and, and, and each individual performer might need or want different things. Um, I think I spoke to you a bit about it earlier. At the moment, I'm finding it really challenging because we're working with masks and we can't get close to each other. I often would normally actually use touch as a way of communicating information or, or proxi <laughs> more proximity than I'm able to at the moment. Mm. Um, we're using lots of words um, to talk about things. But, but just in terms of the rehearsal room and how it works, often Richard will do something and, and ask and say in the room, Sarah, what am I doing? And sometimes I'll give a, um, a physical explanation of what he's doing that might be an easier way for a, you know, a performer to, to find out how to em embody behavior then. <laughs> I mean, it's such a it's fascinating a role. It's so interesting to hear, again, how it's changed, you know, how it's developed. And of course, yeah. um, chatting with uh, Mark earlier, he was talking yeah. about how it feels different without the chorus. So, you know, Dan, tell us a little bit about, about the chorus and, and what you're hoping they'll bring. What is their, their role here? Um, well, there are two jobs for chorus um, in this production. One is the singing job, which our, the entirety of our regular chorus is doing, off stage in the wings. Um, but we're hoping to make... Uh, a virtue out of this necessity. We're doing this for, for COVID-friendly reasons because it's, we haven't got the stage space to separate them all and be able to move. Um, but we are hoping to um, have them piped into the auditorium so they become um, an audience for Tito, the, poli the, the mm, populist politician um, to play to, uh, something we couldn't do if they were on stage. Uh, we are also using um, four of our uh, choristers as uh, actors in the production. And they've done, a splen they've done splendid jobs. Yeah, really they have. So, I've got one final question for you all. What are you most looking forward to about getting this production on stage? Dan, I'll start off with you. Um, watching it grow. I mean, once uh, a show the show is like a seed. I mean, you, you plant it at the general. You put this the first time it has an audience. And then, like, I say like a, like a plant, but it can be also like a Frankenstein monster. It grows and it develops its own life that's shared between its performers and its audience. Um, it is fascinating to see how it develops. Mm. Matilda, yeah. how about you? Um, I think it's such, we've got such an amazing cast and team, so I'm really looking forward to seeing it grow on stage and I think during this pandemic we've all been deprived of live <laughs> music and drama mm. and theatre and so to bring it to an audience and be able to communicate again in that way is going to be really exciting. Yeah. And Sarah, if you could just finish off with something incredibly profound to take us out. <laughs> so no thanks, no Sarah. But just, um, just that communal experience, so the first night is what I'm looking for. It's when you know, a moment can feel like a universe of time or when the whole audience, everybody's attention is on one tiny thing, like one shift of weight or one change of expression or, 
or you know, one note that kind of spins forever. That, that's the thing that I get so excited about when I'm watching a piece of theatre, music, opera, theatre, and I just think it's the most incredible thing in the world when it works. Oh, well, that was suitably beautiful. <laughs> well, that is a really spellbinding depiction, I think, of, of how it feels to be an audience member, that, that feeling of hanging on like that. So thank you so, so much for chatting to me, Sarah, Matilda, Dan. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. As ever, I am just incredibly sad to say that that is all we have got time for. An enormous thank you to my fantastic guests this evening. We've had some incredible performances, some wonderful answers. I've been utterly captivated. I don't know about you. Don't forget that, of course, you can watch La Clemenza de Tito live when it is streamed around the world on the 21st of May. So make sure you have visited the Royal Opera House website and that you have secured your ticket. You are not going to want to miss it. But all that's left to say is a huge thank you to you at home for tuning in. I'm so glad you were able to join us. I hope you enjoyed tonight's insight, supported by Rolex. Good night. <laughs>